Welcome everyone to the Inspired Riding interview series. I'm so excited to bring to you a very talented woman with a big heart that I've known um, for quite a while and we met back in Texas. Her name is Rachel Steen with the Balance Point Equestrian Center and she has now moved to North Carolina and this is the beautiful background of her horses over there now. So welcome Rachel, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, I'm so excited to, to get to you know, do this with you. It's been so long since we've talked and uh, nice to catch up. You know, you are the trend center setter. You, you moved uh, north from Texas first. So, you know, I had to just move just a little bit further north. Uh, I'm glad that you're settled in now and I'm so glad we're doing this today. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you do with your horses now? Well, uh, just a little preface about, you know, where I've come from and that is you know for the last uh 18 years I did a holistic equine rehab and I worked a lot with rescue horses and I'd have you know do training but you know typically would have about 40 horses at a time and uh with most of them being rescues I really had a chance to try different uh different things to help their problems and so I had a chance, you know, for the last 18 years to really do my own case studies about what products worked and how do I help them and, and what training techniques work. And so, you know, uh, when you were talking about rescue horses, uh, I was like, yeah, let's, let's talk about some of the things that I've had experience with. Um, now I've, I've downsized. Um, so I went from a 40 acre ranch with, you know, about typically um, uh, over 35 horses at a time. And now I've moved and I, I've just got 22 acres uh, forest, most of it's forest, and I've only uh, got eight horses now. So I'm really excited to get to spend time with my eight. Horses. <laughs> That's still quite a lot. <laughs> well, moved, moved with 10 and then I took two of them up to New Jersey to a student who moved up to New Jersey. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so she wins for the, the Moving North from Texas Award. Um, so her two horses stayed with me for a little while, and then I, I brought them up to New Jersey. Um, very interesting driving horses to New Jersey. I have to say that, uh, like, it was just very interesting being on the New Jersey Turnpike. But, uh, okay. but yeah, anyway, here I, I, uh, I bought this place so that I can really have people come and spend a weekend or a week and do some intensive lessons and just uh, really set their own daily life aside so that they can work on uh, being better trainers and horse people um, and, and instructors as well. So I have an upcoming mm -hmm. clinic in April that's really going to be focused on uh, instructors who want to delve deeper into positive reinforcement because that's what I found that has helped the most in retraining rescue horses is um, setting a course of as uh, as close to pure positive reinforcement as possible, you know, as humanly possible, which is really saying that we try to take all the pressure and aversions, uh, aversives away. So here is just a place for people to come and spend time with horses and spend time with nature and get a feel for what horses really enjoy and how we can work with them without pressure. Um, so I'm excited to have people to start coming out and uh, working with me here. Wonderful. And then just to clarify, they come without horses and work with yours. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay. Um, Good to know. Yeah. Because it is a lot easier to work on yourself when you're not worried about what's happening to your horse. Like a lot of times we go to <laughs> clinics and our horses are tied up or they're in a stall and we're worried about who are they next to and are they okay? And our mind, half of our mind is always with them. So having the horses here, um, we have horses of all different ages and uh, breeds and training. Um, we have a bunch of horses that were rescue horses and a uh, couple that were born on the property in Texas and just, you know, a wide array. And then of course, you know, some Andalusians, people always like playing with Andalusians. So 
I had my my little moment with them as well. <laughs> so yes, you totally didn't you get didn't that. Take yours in the palm now. There's something else about watching them uh, wallow. The beautiful, oh. beautiful used to be white. <laughs> I do wish they could have gone in a pond. That was one of the reasons I left. They wouldn't let them be horses. So yeah. Yes. Well, that that is also one reason why I don't fuss about them being clean because you know if they're happy, that's all that matters. Little dirt uh, doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was telling you about, I, I've taken a lot of the things that I've learned from all those years uh, and I'm doing a, um, I do horse keeping classes online and now I'm offering one uh, that is focused on working with stressed uh, or horses that have had past traumas and, and working, um, trying to get them comfortable and getting them, their metabolism working. Uh, the stress, as, as anyone who's been stressed knows that when you're under a stress, a lot of stress for a long period of time, uh, everything in your body kind of goes into uh, survival mode. And so one of the ways to get them healthier is to convince their body they're no longer in danger. So. That's huge. I just got chills thinking about that class. So I'm really happy you're going to be doing that. Thanks. You're it's welcome. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to ask a really fun question. If you were handed $10 million right now, what would be the first thing you'd do? Well, you know, I would um, definitely try to finish a few things around here because uh, when you start a new place, you figure out, oh, your budget isn't quite where it should be. But one of the things that I would do with that is uh, I would start a nonprofit working with children uh, and horses and other animals and teaching children using positive reinforcement or to use positive reinforcement uh, using animals as a guide. Uh, I did some classes. I did, did after school classes with kids back in Texas and it was so much fun working with the kids and seeing how they would take these concepts of uh, cooperative work and also the concept that we look for what's going right instead of what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. And you would have children that, you know, maybe had some perfectionist parents and so they're always beating themselves up. The children were always, you know, telling themselves they weren't good enough or they're too afraid to try things. And, you know, after a few months of working, uh, learning positive reinforcement, you would start to hear them tell themselves, okay, this is okay, I made a mistake, but I did this right. And they would start talking to themselves <sighs> in a much kinder way. And for me, knowing that um, I help certain kids have some more confidence and that they learn to, um, to basically trust themselves a little bit more, it, it made all the difference. And, and I really would love to see that program uh, become a nationwide program. Like I, I do, for one of the first things I did here was I started a group on Saturday mornings. It's actually free to the um, community uh, teenage girls. So any girl over 11 uh, can come out and we do, we do some uh, little, you know, chores together for like half an hour and then we work with the horses and they just, and they do some games with themselves, with each other. And I think That's trying phenomenal. to, yeah, trying to, to kind of mold their thinking into more creative problem solving and uh, showing them the power of um, taking what you, you know, what is offered and moving from there instead of getting frustrated that, you know, what's offered is not exactly what you want. Um, so yeah, so that, that's what I would do. More chills. This is awesome. <laughs> we'll have lots to talk about later because I have similar ideas for when I have my facility. So perhaps I can add that onto the programs. So. That would be great. Yeah. I love it. Um, I'm going to get into the questions from my group and then we'll come back to some of the ones I had because I want to offer them their questions first, if you don't mind. Um, so my friend Carrie, who's in the Inspired Riding Connection monthly group, she wanted to know about positive reinforcement and addressing the fine line of PTSD rescues between living with a behavior versus correcting 
overcoming behavior. Did that make sense? Sorry, that came out a little funny. Um, did she give a, a specific example there? Yes, there was a scenario. So she has Tony the pony. He'll, he won't stand tied to anything. He'll pull back, break whatever he can, flip himself over, etc. If you correct in any way, he escalates. If you ignore it, he stops. However, I'm not there all the time. And if he needs to be treated by someone other than me, it could get dicey. He will ground tie, but you have to be watching him because he'll pick up his own rope, carry it to where he wants to be, and drop it. He's clever. So that <laughs> last part, I just, when I read that, I just was like, oh my goodness, this is hilarious because um, this is, a, you know, it's very clear how smart Tony the Pony is. Yes. Uh, and that he is renegotiating where he wants to be. And uh, I, 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 I love that he is um, showing his preferences there. Now, as far as tying, so a lot of the horses that I would work with, um, they had past injuries. And one of the injuries that's most common in all horses are injuries to the pole, uh, right behind the, the ears where the halter goes or the bridle. Um, horses, they pull back and they damage uh, the vertebra there and the muscle tissue. And, and so that's one of the most common injuries. And what you find is that once there's an injury there, then they're also more likely to pull back again because they're so sensitive and it's, uh, it, it almost triggers a reflex action, that pain there. Uh, over the years, I've come to think of it as uh, there's probably like a reflex from eons ago when horses had to care about, you know, uh, mountain lions jumping on them and their reflex action to pain in their withers and their pole is to throw themselves over backwards. Um, so I've seen this many times, but the short end of it is that when there is pain there, when there's been an injury, they're more likely to do it again. So to get them through uh, being able to tie, we work on uh, stationing, which is uh, very close to ground tying, but say that we will reinforce for them to be on a mat uh, and wherever the mat goes, then they'll get something good for being on that mat. And uh, sometimes we'll use platforms. They, it's funny how often they will choose to stand on a platform um, just to see if they can get our attention and uh, get some goodies. But yeah, so, so teaching to station, uh, you can also use a target, which target can be anything, but we often use like little fluffy um, micro dusters because they're soft and, and they have little telescoping arms and we can, you know, you can just put your target anywhere. Say if you taught your horse to go to a target, you could put the target in the trailer and have them follow to the trailer to go, okay, the target is where you want me to be. So there's different ways that you can teach the standing and staying in one place behavior. Uh, it requires some practice because we have to have enough experience with the behavior and enough uh, reinforcement history, enough good things happening over and over again for them to naturally want to be there. Um, the great thing about a mat is because you can move the mat anywhere. So wherever you want them, you just throw the mat down and then uh, you know reinforce them for being on the mat and they'll stay. So it doesn't matter who's there. Uh, the other thing is that you can also like if you're having trouble with the horse standing while the farrier's working, uh, give them some alfalfa to eat on. Uh, you know, you, as you start practicing giving them things that they like when they are doing standing still for things that they maybe don't like, they're going to be more cooperative. And the other part of that is always looking for an alternative behavior uh, to the one that you want that's, that's incompatible. So in other words, if you don't want your horse walking off, practicing a lot of standing, but then voluntarily standing uh, will help. The other thing that people don't realize is that giving a horse a choice to walk off 
and come back, to walk off and come back, that will actually help the horse just stand still. It's whenever horses are forced to do something that they're gonna want to do the other. So the more often, like say that you have a horse that spooks a lot. We used to, you know, again, working with rescues, have horses spook a lot. We would work uh, teaching them to walk with us at Liberty. And we walk, you know, our yard, we keep our yard fairly safe, but it's, you know, it was like a five acre yard. So they could run off, they could go check something else, but they would come back. I mean, we, we wouldn't go and challenge, do this challenge until we did a lot of basics. But the point is, is that when you get to a point where you let them go, check whatever they're scared about, come back to you, they will come back to you. And with the standing still, if you give them a chance in practice to go off and if they feel uncomfortable and then come back when they feel comfortable, then you'll get longer standing uh, behaviors. That's brilliant. Yeah, I'm all about giving them choices. I've been experimenting with that a lot more with Pepper and I can feel the difference. It's, it's amazing. So yeah, thank you for all that information. That's awesome. And I love the idea of the, the magic carpet. I've heard that before as well. Um, and, and if anybody wants to learn more about positive reinforcement, I do online classes. I also have um, weekly group classes where people, after they learn certain basics, then they do videos. And we share the videos together because one of the things that we're really big on is trying to help people feel like they have a community support system. Yes. And we often, uh, if we've been in the horse community for very long, we've, we've all felt other people um, kind of say, no, do this, no, do that. And the idea that other people with horses can be supportive is uh, very difficult. It takes practice for us to know that we're safe to show our warts and everything. And um, I love your group for the fact that you're just about positivity and everyone helping everyone else. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate that. And it, it is such an important thing to feel that support and that kindness and to be able to be authentic and, and share what they need. I still remember that shift in me. I, I went and did my certification program. It was a week long for a Certified Horsemen's Association. It was back in California, and there were ten other, um, there were t ten of us total becoming certified, and I was really skeptical. I thought it was going to be this cat fight the whole time, but everyone was so positive and kind and and supportive. I was like, my eyes were wide, like, wow, people can be like this in the horse world. I want more of this. <laughs> so that's, I think, what kind of put that light bulb moment into me like okay let's let's just focus on that now instead um so i appreciate you saying that about my group i'm really really proud of it and all the members are just incredible i'm glad you're in here so. yeah i i i really um it takes a lot of work to keep a group online positive so kudos <laughs> to you for all of your direction thank you and i have to shout out to my mod uh moderators they help catch things that might not be that great and you know, for the past few months or so, we haven't had anything that we had to delete. So that was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> everyone's just kind of getting the vibe and it's very fun. So thank you again for that. Now I'm going to move on to Kelly's question. She would love to know the differences you've become aware of in training of rescue horses. What are common challenges have you had to overcome with rescues? So one of the things that we might not consider uh, right off the bat with rescues is how important uh, routines are for them, for them to understand that there is, uh, there is safety and that safety is in knowing what's going to happen next. And that is, comes from being very uh, careful to keep their, their environment uh, a bit on the, you know, predictable side. So in other words, being careful about how you change their uh, living space, how you change their partners, how you, you know, it, where you take them, giving them a way to have stability even when they're in a new place. Uh, one of the things that we work on with positive reinforcement is to have 
good associations with things such as, you know, like we've talked about our targets, so that when you're going, say, if you have to go to the vet, that you have, you're able to help them know what's happening next by, again, using behaviors that have been positively reinforced. And by doing those behaviors, they kind of calm down. So, uh, you know, in a way, it's like trying to teach the horses to meditate. You know, like, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be okay. Just clear your mind. Let's touch the target a few times. See, we nothing bad happened. Just be in this moment. Don't think about everything that's you know happened in the past. Um, so, so that's that's very important. The other thing that I would say that's most helpful in working with rescue horses is realize that almost all of them have ulcers. Mm -hmm. um, horses that have had trauma they get stressed out, they have a higher acid production in their gut, uh, they've got maybe some pain issues. A lot of rescue horses have some unaddressed pain, which is how they ended up being thrown away in the first place. And so by uh, being able to support their stomach, help them uh, reduce the acid production in the gut, then you're able to give them sort of a, a clear playing field. Uh, I always tell people, think about when you're sick and how the slightest little thing annoys you and, you know, you're more likely to like go off for no reason if you don't feel good. You know, even if you've had like a, a toothache that won't go away or a headache that won't go away, you don't want to deal with anyone. And so when horses, when their uh, stomachs just don't feel right, you know, you may not see any signs of it other than them being just really grumpy or aggressive. Uh, they might be eating quickly. That's uh, one thing that we find a lot of horses that uh, have ulcers, they have a tendency to eat super fast because they're just trying to get food in, get their stomach as quickly as possible. They're more likely to choke. So there's, um, there's things that you can do as far as feeding uh, wet alfalfa cubes and letting them eat over a long period of time. Also treating with uh, ulcer guard or gastro guard or omeprazole. There's many things that you can do, but just giving your horse a chance to get a little relief from pain that can help tremendously. Also keep in mind that when we give horses pain, uh, pain meds such as banamine or bute, for pain issues that that also can upset the gut. So we need to give them gastric support there as well. So if you have a horse that maybe is colicky and you give them banamine, uh, you also wanna give them some omeprazole to help buffer that because otherwise then you're gonna have continued problems. That's great to know. And we were just discussing that last night with Penny, if you have time to watch that, uh, we were talking about a lot of alternatives and she creates digestive bars. It's pretty amazing. That's great. Yes. Well, I've used many holistic um, remedies over the years, and I, I would definitely recommend that for prevention. But yeah. when yeah. you are in an acute state, then you definitely need the medication. Need the big guns. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I tell it's like I have chronic asthma, and I try my best to do everything holistically to, to stay healthy and stay well. But if something happens and I'm in a severe attack, I'm going to take the meds to make sure that I keep living. Yes, we want that. <laughs> Stay with us, please. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Um, do you want to talk about a heart horse of yours and what made them special? Well, I've, I've been blessed to have several heart horses. Um, you know, that's one of the things about, you know, I guess getting older is you get to see how, you know, beginnings, you get to see beginnings and endings. And, and I've been blessed to have horses, uh, you know, grow up with me. And, and I've, I've been privileged to be there when I had to say goodbye. Um, it's heartbreaking, but it is worth all of the pain. Uh, my, my first heart horse was uh, my horse, Major Sport Twist, who, uh, from the time I was 10 to, uh, I can't remember, but we were together for 31 years. So that is, makes me, I was 41 then when I had, he passed. Yeah, and so 
for 31 years we were together and I, you know he went to college with me uh up in Oregon and um he he came to Texas and he helped so many of the horses that I had in for training and there is something very special about having a older horse who can just tell the newer horses hey everything's okay this is a great place you're going to be fine and the sport was able to um just kind of radiate this calm assurance to humans and horses alike and i learned so much from him and he was actually the first horse that I started with positive reinforcement. Uh, I, as a, as a young child, I tamed feral cats. Wow. And uh, so in that process, you know, I, I, when I was very young, I lived on a 164 acre ranch and uh, in, in Northwest Texas. And so, you know, obviously didn't have lots of little kids to play with, but I had all sorts of animals that I would, <laughs> I would train and work with them. And so Taming Feral Cats actually taught me the most about working force-free because obviously if you make a mistake, um, they're either going to run away or they're going to swat you. And <laughs> I, I learned a lot about patience and a lot about observing uh, behavior and a lot about re you know uh, using food to help them feel calmer around me. And I use that when I started working with sport, when um, he was actually started out as my sister's horse because my sister's horse had him as a baby. Okay. And then uh, her horse died and she, sport was a reminder of pain. And so I, I always loved sport. So I've always intended on getting him, but he was then mine and I started training him. And I would teach him to stay like uh, in Hawaii, we weren't allowed to, um, tie horses to the porch railing and we didn't have any fences around the place so um <laughs> I mean, he had a fence for his pen but like the yard wasn't fenced so I taught him to stay um and stand outside the porch railing and uh wait for me to come back with treats and I uh, would actually go we'd go to the beach and go swim in the water and then find some grass for him to eat and just hang out there and we'd go into town and uh I'd have him stay outside the the shave ice place so I could run in and get shave ice. And, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so he really taught me all the things that could be. And then, you know, I started meeting people as I got older and getting into this is how you're supposed to do it. You're not supposed to do it that way. And mm -hmm. and um so you know I lost my way for a little while, but um he everything that I did with him always came back to whenever I would learn something new, I'd be like, you know, eventually I'd be like, but this doesn't feel the same. How can I get that same level of um, togetherness and communication? And he was incredibly smart. So like he could unlatch any gate. Um, I used to have actually padlock his oh, no. pasture um, when I'd go to school to make sure he didn't get out. Um, so I was very fortunate to have him as a teacher and um, I, I I saw horses being abused at the polo stables mm -hmm. nearby and so I tried training him without any tack um, thinking you know that if we could learn how to work together without anything then even though I didn't know anything we'd have to be doing something right so you know obviously this was before the internet so I couldn't just google something um, you know, I was on an island and I didn't have any resources. So I just went with what he told me and we went very far. It's actually, people would see us riding through the neighborhood, um, bridalists. And, uh, that's how I actually started getting my first training jobs, uh, horse training yeah. jobs is people would be like, that's really cool. Um, can you work with our horses? We can't, uh, get on them. So. That's fantastic. And I love how you just naturally did this as a child and then allowed him to show you more things. This is incredible. Well, he was my best friend and I wanted him to be happy. And that made a huge difference in how I approached things. And, uh, you know, when we would go places, we did trail riding, you know, when I, when I first started riding, 
I would ride uh, the moment I got home from school until dark. And so uh, I had this very strange view at the time that if I rode less than two hours, then it wasn't a real ride. Oh. <laughs> you know, I spent, I spent all my time uh, and then I, uh, I started getting, you know, the other jobs and working with other horses and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I wanted him happy. And when we'd go out on the trails, I'd be like, where do you want to go? You know, and I'd let him, you know, kind of explore. And it, it was um, priceless. Absolutely. That sounds like a phenomenal relationship. Thank you for sharing that. I'm like seeing these amazing images. What, what part of Hawaii? I, I grew up on the North Shore of Oahu. Okay. So I was actually right near the last um, sugar uh, working sugar mill. Okay. So I was out in the country. Um, actually, when I graduated from high school, the sugar mill closed. So uh, part of our uh, high our high school was doing projects about what they could do for agriculture. And the neat thing has been that they really tried to keep the community Wailua uh, in into agriculture. So if you go there now even though there is obviously more tourism now, but there's also uh, a lot of uh, diverse agricultural ventures that have filled in where the sugarcane fields were. Okay. What a great way to grow up though. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was special. Um, we, we spent every day at the beach and actually the, the days that I'd miss, uh, like say if I'd gotten sick or something, or if the weather was just too bad, uh, we, we lived a block from the beach. Oh, and, uh, but if I didn't take him swimming, uh, then the next time I'd go, then he would just, he wouldn't get out until he was done. And <laughs> there is absolutely no way to pull a horse out of the ocean. Oh so. <laughs> just hang on, we're going. <laughs> I learned, I learned all sorts of things about how to negotiate with my horse so that we didn't end up in those kind of situations. That's amazing. Where's, uh, regarding that, is there anything new that you've learned lately? Uh, in horses? Yes, because I know you said you were taking some more classes lately. Oh, oh yeah, so um, I, I am continuing my uh, behavioral science studies and specifically uh, more details in positive reinforcement training. And um, there are some great classes online taught by uh, university professors in behavioral science, which will give you a chance to continue your education, you know, even though I'm not currently in a graduate program, but uh, it's fun. I just finished a reinforcement systems class that uh, it was very um, kind of looking at some nuances of how specifically things are done. Um, you know, I always look for alternatives to working with food um, with with rescue horses, food is gonna be your way to start because uh, just being near a person has a lot of uh, aversive feel. Right. But when you are working with horses that you've raised, then a lot, you know, scratches are wonderful, but also um, whether it's horses or cats or whatever, things that you can let them do. Like uh, for instance, my, I have a couple of horses that find water just, amazing so if uh just like with my horse sport if i let him go to the beach then he would put up with me doing other things and if uh my horse is here if they you know are uh cooperate for certain things then i'll be okay let's go to the pond and you can play um so there's there's alternatives to finding things that you're horse likes to do just on a daily basis and incorporate that. And that was really cool with this reinforcement systems classes. There's a lot of technical stuff that I'm not going to share, but the fun stuff was just realizing that those things that I did as a kid, listening to my horse, uh, those are actually um, 
acknowledged as, you know, things that you want to do. Brilliant. So it's beautiful confirmation for you. It really was. Yeah, it felt good. So cool. Okay, I have one last question for you. If you were to write on a billboard something really short for the whole horse world to see, what would it say? You know, I was thinking last night about this and I was like, man, that's hard. <laughs> um, uh, it's not short, but what I really thought was important was for people to understand that it's okay to get help with their horse because you're not um, born knowing everything and uh, you don't have to just automatically be the best horse trainer out there. Um, because I see a lot of people who they struggle on their own, not because they feel like if they can't do everything right with their horse just naturally, then there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize uh, how much, like say you or I, who our whole life revolves around teaching and training, how much we work to try to um, keep on top of as much information as possible and new ways of teaching and helping people and, and helping their horses and how much heartache we've been through in our own experiences. So uh, I would really just like people to know it's okay to get help and that, um, you know, you're not alone. I love that. So here's, here's my interpretation. It's okay to get help. You don't have to be the best as long as you keep yourself open to learning. Yes, that's... Sound good? That sounds perfect. I love it. Rachel, thank you so much. This was a beautiful conversation. I really appreciate your time and your generous information today. Well, I really appreciate being on with you. It's so fun to catch up. And uh, totally. I am totally available for uh, if anyone wants to ask more questions, uh, please feel free. Excellent. And how can people get a hold of you? Uh, so the easiest way is to email at joyfulhorse at gmail.com, okay. but uh, you can also find me at uh, the Balance Point Equestrian Center on Facebook, okay. or if you want to uh, get me on Instagram, it is equestrian underscore zen, uh, and I do have a podcast, the Equestrian Zen Podcast, uh, just started putting up some new um, some new episodes. So we're going to start uh, getting that again. You know, I just went through this move across country, kind of lost track of a bunch of things, but uh, I'm excited to be back and, and able to share with people all of the hard-earned things that uh, I've learned over the years. Fantastic. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed this interview as much as I did and that you go check out all of Rachel's social and reach out to her with any questions. Uh, thanks again for being here. Remember to lead with kindness for yourself and for your horse. And may the horse be with you always. <laughs>